Well, Sam McTrusty, you had the same kind of junior career that many people had at East Wren. Just give us some of your recollections of these days. So I think I joined around the age of 12, 13. I can't fully remember because it was a bit of a blurred line from just joining my dad. He would play nine holes and I would sneak a golf club into his bag and I wouldn't hit a shot until I was on the third hole. So we were out of sight of the clubhouse. Um, and then I, when I went to school, I had a few friends that were members here just through luck. So joined up at the same time as them. And then I basically lived my whole teenage life here. And instead of going out to bars and clubs, I would come here at the weekend and practice and eventually started playing medals and playing for the Fleming Watson team, which was a quick learning curve, <laughs> to say the least, because I'd only really played competitive golf against my friends, which is quite friendly and as many jokes as you can possibly fit in to then being, you know, super serious and almost combative against other kids at other clubs around the area. So, yeah, my, my, junior, my junior golf is filled with basically learning to play the game at a respectful, but kind of like, almost in, your, in my mind, I was like on the route to being a professional, but nowhere near the skill level. But that was the experience that I got in terms of competition golf. But your golfing friends were also music fans, and there, yep. there was the nucleus of your career. Yeah, it's almost, it, it does sound far-fetched when I tell people that without golf I wouldn't be a musician. Um, I fell into a group of guys that we were into like alternative rock music and punk rock, and we would go to... Like if a, if a band from the States was coming to play Glasgow, we would go to their show on say a Friday night or a, a Saturday night and then the next morning we'd have a tea time up here <laughs> to review the show that we'd seen in like the Barrowlands the night before. And because I fell into that friend group, it was a constant evolution of playing golf. I mean, you're out there for four, I say four hours. As a junior, I got dropped off at sunrise and picked up after sunset. So you were here for 12, 13 hours a day talking about music, and that's really where like I started to get hooked into the culture of like rock music. And that's the point when most parents say, listen, son, you need to get a proper job. <laughs> if that advice was ever given to you, you must have ignored it because your proper job has been a very successful career in music. Yeah, I still don't feel like I've got a proper job to this <laughs> day, so I'm very lucky I, made, I managed to make a hobby a career. Um, Tell us about the band and, and how it came about. Well, I play in a rock band called Twin Atlantic and it came about through... Really, the origin was I was going to... I went to Glasgow School of Art, so I was based in the city centre every day and I was going to a lot of, like, again, smaller, more independent rock shows or indie bands playing in the bars in Glasgow. And... The deeper I got into like creating art, I studied fine art, painting and print making, which is quite a kind of like solo pursuit. And I found that I was wearing headphones, listening to music a lot. Um, and that just snowballed into opportunities of playing in the bars. Because I, went, because I went to art school and because I then was allowed to work in the trendy bars, I had a kind of fast track into getting to play the right places at the right time in front of the right people. And it just snowballed into being getting support from BBC Scotland and then BBC introduce, Introducing, which then we got upgraded to BBC Radio 1 and it's still to this day has just been baby steps for us. So that bohemian lifestyle clearly got you up and running, but you've now headlined at some fantastic gigs. Tell me about these. Yeah, well, in our own right, we've, I mean, we've toured all around the world from Australia, South Africa, around the States and Canada multiple times. At home, we've headlined the Hydro and headlined Teen the Park years ago. So, pretty varied career. Don't get me wrong, we still go to some cities around the world and play to like a hundred people. <laughs> We're quite a peculiar band in that way. But you've also played to what, hundred, what, 75,000 at times? Yeah, we've, we've supported bigger bands. Um, 
football stadiums or arenas, Milton Keynes Bowl probably been the largest one. I think that's like seventy five thousand, give or take. Headline of the Hydro in Glasgow. Headline the Hydro in Glasgow twenty fifteen I think. Um, so a bit of a blur. So like asking me to remember the dates is quite <laughs> a tricky thing, but. Um, Again, I, I don't. I think I might have a bit of an addi- addictive personality, but I've channeled it in the right way, which is probably explains why after all these years I'm still interested in golf. It's a thing that you'll never master. So there's something in your soul keeps bringing you back to East Ren. Is it to keep you grounded? Is it to remind yourself of your roots? I mean, what is it? I think I've just got such a special relationship with not just the membership but the golf course and it's a place that because I grew up here I mean I literally grew up here I used to do my homework in the junior section and um, I've already mentioned I used to get I used to get dropped off at sunrise here and then picked up 11 p.m. in the summertime so I, I really did spend a huge part of my childhood here so when I, when I come back to play it's not just a feeling of Oh, I'm playing golf today. It's almost like a kind of spiritual connection I have to the place. You no longer have to go to the hatch to get your food. You're allowed I, to eat in the lounge. <laughs> I'm allowed to speak in the clubhouse. I'm allowed to <laughs> use the facilities. Yeah, I mean, when, when, I, when I joined, it was um, maybe a bit more of a frosty environment for junior golf. But obviously golf itself as a sport is now a lot more youth-centric because it's a lot more of an athletic experience. So... It's, it's, like, it's good to see that the place has moved forward with the times. Juniors now don't have to be uh, tucked away in a corner, basically. <laughs> and if there was a rock icon I associated with golf growing up, it was Alice Cooper. <laughs> so I wonder if you're the Alice Cooper of East Wren. I'm happy to take that uh, nickname if you're going to be the one to spread <laughs> it. But um, again, Alice Cooper, obviously, he, his addiction to golf was a distraction from his other, his other addictions but the the connection between golf and music is is very very close i mean you have to master a certain craft by practicing there's a there's a mental side to the to, to you know to both what's the word i'm looking for obviously i've ruined the interview art there, forms no no what's the word i was looking for there that's going to irritate me a Anyway, I was, off, I was off on a tangent there, it doesn't Tell matter. You what, I'll, but... ask, I'll ask that question again. Okay, dog. Um, in some ways, Sam, there's a, there's a connection between golf and music. Mm-hmm. How do you see it? To me, both practices are very closely linked. And I've mentioned this a few times. To I've been lucky enough to be, you know, to play golf with high-level pros because they're either fans of the band or... Time to name drop who have you played with. Well, I'm spoiled and I've, I've been allowed to compete in the Dunhill Lynx Championship twice. So I've definitely rubbed shoulders with the top elite golfer. I mean, I've been on the driving range in the bay next to Rory McIlroy, trying not to shank it into his, uh, his back. So I've been partners with Charlie Hoffman and Ryder Cup golfers of our era, um, played in the Scottish Open Pro-Am two or three times, so I'm very, very spoiled that because of music, I mean, you know, I've gone full circle now where I've been given invites to golf events because of music, so just in that way, music and golf have intertwined in my life, but the practices themselves where it's a solo endeavour, you have to practice your craft to obviously get any sort of like forward momentum. And I just find the lessons that I learned in golf early in life, being a junior here, without the grind of being out there practicing in the rain and going through the tough times, that I kind of equate them to like playing this the small grimy venues to five people in a thousand cap room. I mean, I I I tend to draw parallels between the two, and golf gave me a sort of mental toughness that a lot of other things in life wouldn't have provided and when you come back and play at East Ren how do you now compare it to other courses you've played elsewhere in the world (laughs) I didn't seriously think about that 
um, the beauty to East Ren for me is that you never get the same shot twice across 18 holes. I mean, there's two of the most challenging par threes in the country on this golf course. Um, so if you go and play the 16th at Carnoustie, to me that's as difficult as the 11th hole here for different different reasons, obviously. But I, I just find that it's such a challenge as a, just the layout itself, never mind when you throw into it the fact that we're at such an elevation that the wind and the, the elements are at play. But it's a golf course that I've, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I've played it a thousand times, if not more, and I'm still finding new areas of the course and new elements that I'm still trying to wrap my head around, which is quite confusing because it's quite a short, in, in, mo in modern golf terms, it's quite a short experience, but um, one that is still challenging and confusing me to this day. Sam, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.